welcome back to Defeating Darwinism. This week we are starting on chapter four. And before we jump right into chapter four, I want to review the outline that Dr. Johnson gave us in chapter two in Leo's letter. So if you turn to page 21 in your book, I want you to refresh your memory here that he told us first, second, and third, what he was going to cover in the next few chapters. So first, in chapters two and three, Dr. Johnson was covering the oversimplification of the evolution debate by seeing this as a conflict between science and the Bible. And if we could just get science and the Bible to agree on some middle ground, then this whole debate will disappear. And he wants to caution you against that. That is oversimplifying what is going on here. The truth is evolution is trying to remove the existence of God from the start of the world by saying it wasn't created by God, or if he did that, it, he's not involved now. So chapters two and three, which we've just read, have covered that. Now, chapter four is going to build on that by jumping into the science of it, okay? So chapter four is going to focus on the blind watchmaker's thesis, and which we're going to describe in this chapter. Um, this is basically the claim that God is unnecessary for creation to have happened, that this could actually have happened without God. However, we are going to learn about five fallacies today that make that scientifically impossible, okay? Creation could not have happened. The, the evolution could not have happened without an intelligent designer. And that is actually the catch that scientists are stuck on today. No one has yet been able to describe how evolution has been able to happen without an intelligent designer. We're also gonna do the third thing. Science has a philosophical bias that needs to be exposed. And essentially what Dr. Johnson is describing there is that science cannot through experiment or through observation explain how evolution took place or how creation took place. So science evolution is a religion just like creation. It must be believed in on faith just like creation must be believed in on faith. Therefore, we can't separate this as a discussion of science and a discussion of religion because evolution is in a way its own religion because it must be accepted on faith. There are not um, scientific facts and proof to dispute any discrepancies. Okay, so we're gonna cover both of those different kind of fallacies. In chapter four, you can flip over with me, mine is on page 53. Uh, this is a real education in evolution. What I want you to know as we're outlining and overviewing this chapter, there's um, two main sections. The first is the fallacies in evolution, and we're going to cover five fallacies in evolution. The second section is the fallacies in creation, and we're going to cover two fallacies in creation. And this is really going to explain to you why people are so so strongly wanting to believe in evolution and wanting to take God out of the creation story. These two fallacies in creation are very tender to people's heart. But let's jump into this and see if we can't start to understand the holes in each of these theories. A popular teacher encourages young people to raise the big issues and think for themselves and gets in trouble for it. A bright young student takes a stand for freedom of thought and runs smack into a wall of official dogma. The authorities use the law to intimidate dissenters and try to discourage citizens from thinking for themselves about the evidence for evolution. Where have we seen this before? It's a replay of Inherit the Wind, of course, with the characters trading roles. The possibility that Henry Drummond raised in the play has come true. The Darwinists did get a law saying that only Darwinism may be taught in the schools, but they got it from the Supreme Court, not the legislature. In a 1987 decision, you might highlight that pink, the Supreme Court held unconstitutional a Louisiana state law that attempted to require balanced treatment for creation and evolution in the public school classroom. A state may not require, said the majority opinion, that the religious viewpoint that a supernatural being created humankind be given fair treatment as an alternative to evolution in science classes. In context, that meant that the opposite opinion, 
that humankind was created by a purposeless natural process that cares nothing about us would be taught as unchallengeable fact. Justice Antonin Scalia, I don't know if I'm saying that right. Antonin Scalia. Um, I highlight that name pink. Argued in dissent that the people of a state, including those who are Christian fundamentalists, are quite entitled as a secular matter to have whatever scientific evidence there may be against evolution presented in their schools. Just as Mr. Scopes, who was played by Burt Cates in the movie, was entitled to present whatever scientific evidence there was for it. The majority emphatically disagreed. Only Darwin may be taught in the schools. It's interesting how we have a total role reversal from Inherit the Wind now. The predictable result of this one-sided educational and legal regime is that evolution has become the focus of a culture war instead of a subject that can be discussed constructively in educational institutions or in the political realm of negotiation and compromise. The science educators teach the students that they were created by evolution and that evolution is a purposeless and unsupervised natural process. Of course, those statements go far beyond the scientific evidence and state a religious position, but educators who insist with a straight face that they are not saying anything about religion or God. That goes back to the first point. They are trying to separate this religion and science when it's not really possible because both are faith-based. If they were addressing the subject of religion, they would have to allow the other side to be argued. Therefore, they must not be addressing it. Now, I highlighted that sentence yellow because I feel like that's a main point for how this argument gets handled in, in politics today. When students ask intelligent questions like, is this stuff really true? Teachers are encouraged or required not to take the question seriously. Instead, they put the students off with public relations jargon about how the scientific enterprise is reliable and self-correcting. In California, for example, state curriculum guidelines advise teachers not to go into the merits of objections to evolution in class, where other students might be influenced, but to tell objecting students to take such questions up with their parents or a minister. When a teacher does try to take the objection seriously, the result is likely to be a lawsuit from the American Civil Liberties Union or People for the American Way, plus bad publicity in the press. School administrators understandably catapult and tell teachers and students to stop making trouble. In short, Bert Cates and Henry Drummond have far surpassed their predecessors in using the tool of power to keep dissent from getting out of hand. The situation is obviously unfair to the dissenters, but never mind that for now. I'm more concerned to point out to the scientific community how bad it is for science and for education. Here is what I want to say to the scientists and educators. History has taught us that an established religion tends to fall into bad habits. And the same thing may be true when a scientific establishment starts to act like a governmental body with an official ideology to uphold. That's what is happening in the Darwinian debate right now. The price of having that kind of position is that you are tempted to protect your power and wealth by defending things you shouldn't be defending with methods like double talk and intimidating threats of legal action that you shouldn't be using. These have become bad habits and they eventually lead you into massive hypocrisy and self-deception. Evolution and the um, advocators of it is now falling into the exact same pit holes that old time religion did by trying to strong arm and force people to believe what they believe instead of having an open conversation and allowing everyone to believe what they want to. When you preach baloney detecting as the essential tool of science, but make students turn their baloney detectors off when they get to the really important questions of origins, you convict yourself every day of hypocrisy. You also lose the ability to think critically about your own beliefs, and eventually you set yourself up for the kind of embarrassment that destroyed Matthew Harrison Brady. There is only one cure. No matter how badly you want to bury the tough questions, you have to acknowledge that those questions really are too tough to be settled with misleading slogans like evolution is fact and science and religion are separate realms. 
Now, I highlighted the first half of that sentence um, down to the point too tough to be settled. That is something that as an evolutionist or a creationist, the goal is to recognize and admit where your theory falls short. And that's why we're going to cover the big fallacies on both sides of this argument. You have to admit that people have reasons for objecting to the materialist philosophy you are presenting in the name of science. If you are going to be educators instead of dogmatists, you are going to have to start dealing honestly with those objections. You need to turn your baloney detectors on yourselves. It hurts a lot at first, but eventually you will learn to enjoy it. Trust me, I've tried it. Now we're going to start our first section, critical thinking and evolutionary biology. And he's going to actually number the five fallacies in here. So when we get to each one, we can highlight these green. Can we begin to treat evolution as a subject for education rather than a culture war? Of course we can. If I were designing a curriculum for high school or college students in evolution, I would build it around the same principles of baloney detecting we considered in the preceding chapter. Here are some of the things I would want students to learn. Number one, learn to distinguish between what scientists assume and what they investigate. Contemporary scientists don't investigate what the Supreme Court called the religious viewpoint that a supernatural being created humankind or anything else. They disregard that possibility because they consider things supernatural to be outside of science. In other words, scientists start by assuming that naturalism is true. That's what creationists do as well. We assume creation is true because that's what the Bible says. Then we look for science to back it up. We're both doing the same thing here. That's why they're both faith-based. Then they try to give purely natural explanations for everything, including our existence. Because of that assumption, scientists do not really consider whether evolution, as distinguished from creation, is true or whether evolution might be guided by God. They assume that evolution is the only possibility and that it is unguided because in their minds, both special creation and guided evolution fall in the territory of religion, not science. They also assume that natural selection has great creative power, not because that power can be demonstrated, but because there is no better naturalistic alternative. Students should regard the neo-Darwinism theory of evolution then as merely the best naturalistic explanation of our existence that science can provide. Whether it is true is another question. And we cannot go into that question unless we are allowed to consider the possibility that a creator exists. Understand, and when they say a creator exists, they mean the possibility that any intelligent design designer exists, including Christian's God or being something else. It is the matter that there is intelligent creation in our DNA that we cannot explain naturalistically. So, um, but because that is so close to the idea of a Christian God, nobody wants to touch on that subject at all. Understanding the crucial role of philosophy in Darwinism is the key to understanding why the theory is so controversial and why students want so badly to dodge the hard questions. Biologists have authority over questions of biology, but they have no authority to impose a philosophy on society. Once the public understands what they are doing, the biologists will lose their power to exclude dissent. That means once the public understands that evolutionists are creating a philosophical, a faith-based theory, they lose the ability to impose their theory as fact because faith-based is not in their um, science field. That is why it is so important for them to insist that evolution is a fact Change that to evolution is a philosophy and the game is over. Now, all these questions are allowed to be debated and discussed. Did creation require a creator? Highlight that question green. You can assume a negative answer to that question on philosophical grounds, or you can treat it as a question of fact, open to scientific investigation, but you can't legitimately do both. I would teach students to be distrustful of textbook authors or other authorities who try to have it both ways. I want to pause here just for a second 
I think anybody who understands logic and understands reasoning will be able to recognize that there are questions in both theories that have to be accepted on faith that science has not yet proved. It has not proved creation. It has not proved evolution. It possibly will not be able to because one, nobody was there to observe it that is alive today. And two, we are not capable of recreating it in our lifespan. So there's no way we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt what happened at creation or at the onset of the earth. Therefore, even when I was in high school and I was doing the International Baccalaureate program, and this was a topic that we would debate in class a lot, even back then, um, and nobody told me this, I had never read this book before, but I could recognize that neither one had the answers scientifically and that both had to be taken on faith. And that was the first thing and the first conversation I would have with my non-religious friends was to get them to think about both theories on an equal basis. Then you can investigate each one and decide what makes most logical sense to you and what has most science backing and what you actually believe in. But I feel like that conversation is only fair to be had if we understand that both have gaps that science cannot prove and both have to be trusted on faith. Number two, learn to use terms precisely and consistently. Evolution is a term of many meanings and the meanings have a way of changing without notice. Dog breeding and finch beak variations are frequently cited as typical examples of evolution. So is the fact that all the differing races of humans descended from a single parent, or even that Americans today are larger on average than they were a century ago due to better nutrition. If relatively minor variations like that were all evolution were about, there would be no controversy, and even the strictest biblical fundamentalist would be evolutionist. Of course, evolution is about a lot more than in-species variation. We talked about this in a previous video. The important issue is whether the dog breeding and finch beak examples fairly illustrate the process that created animals in the first place. Using the single term evolution to cover both the controversial and uncontroversial aspects of evolution is a recipe for misunderstanding. I highlighted that last sentence yellow. We talked about the importance of that in a previous video and they're gonna break down micro and macro evolution now. At a minimum, students must learn to distinguish between microevolution, cyclonal variation within the type, as in the finch beak example. Everything he just talked about is microevolution. And macroevolution, the vaguely described process that supposedly creates innovations such as new complex organs or new body parts. Don't be impressed by claims that in a few borderline cases, microevolution may be produced or almost produced new species. The definition of species is flexible and sometimes means no more than isolated breeding group. By such a definition, a fruit fly that breeds in August rather than June may be considered a new species, although it remains a fruit fly. So remember that can be deceptive. The question is how we get insects and other basic groups in the first place. Darwinists typically, but not always, claim that macroevolution is just microevolution continued over a very long time. The claim is very controversial and students should learn why. Number three, keep your eye on the mechanism of evolution. It's the all important thing. Some Darwinists distinguish between what they call the fact of evolution and Darwin's particular mechanism. The fact usually just means that organisms have certain similarities like the DNA genetic code and are grouped in patterns, mammals, fish, insects, and so on. This pattern of nature is uncontroversial. What is controversial is the cause of the pattern. And particularly, whether that cause involves a creator or only a purposeless material mechanism. I highlighted that section green. They didn't word it as a question with a question mark, but it is a question and it's an important one to answer. The problem with separating the fact from the mechanism is that a so-called fact of evolution doesn't have much scientific context without a testable mechanism for changing one kind of creature into something entirely different, and especially for building the extremely complex organs that all living things possess. 
Darwin knew this. It's the first major point he makes in On the Origin of Species. The pattern of organisms would provide unsatisfactory evidence for evolution, he argued, until it could be shown how the innumerable species inhabiting this world have been modified, so as to acquire that perfection of structure which most justly excites our admiration. Okay, that's a quote from The Origin of Species, and you can highlight that pink if you want to remember that. <clears throat> Darwin's mechanism was natural selection. Today, despite many efforts to find an alternative, there still isn't really a competitor to the two-part Darwinian mechanism of random variation, mutation, and natural selection. Darwinists argue with each other about the relative importance of chance and selection, but some combination of those two elements is just about the only game in town. Remember that the mechanism has to be able to design and build very complex structures like wings and eyes and brains. Remember also that it has to have done this reliably again and again. Despite offhand references in the literature to possible alternatives, Darwinian natural selection remains the only serious candidate for a mechanism that might be able to do the job. That, by the way, explains why many Darwinists are reluctant to make a clear distinction between microevolution and macroevolution. They have evidence for a mechanism for minor variations, as illustrated by the Finchbeak example, but have no distinct mechanism for the really creative kind of evolution, the kind that builds new body plans and new complex organs. Either macroevolution is just microevolution continued over a longer time, or it's a mysterious process with no known mechanism. A process like that isn't all that different from a miraculous or God-guided process, and it certainly wouldn't support those expansive philosophical statements about evolution being purposeless and undirected. So they're kind of stuck here between a rock and a hard place. In my experience, the distinction between the fact of evolution and the neo-Darwinian theory always turns out to be just a debating gimmick to hide the problem with the mechanism from scrutiny. Once the fact is established, it turns out to include the necessary mechanism, which is mutation and selection. Don't let anybody tell you that the mechanism is a mere detail. It's what the main controversy is mainly about. Highlight that sentence yellow, okay? It's not just something trivial for us to figure out at a later time. It is the main argument over whether this is true or not. When critics subject the mechanism to detailed criticism, Darwinists very quickly run out of evidence. That's when they want to substitute a vague fact, which will later be inflated to include the whole theory. It's another example of bait and switch. I want to summarize number three for you because I feel like it's a little bit wordy. Essentially, the mechanism of evolution, mechanism means how does this actually happen, okay? Nobody knows how we actually change from frogs to alligators, okay? No one can figure that out. So when someone tries to overlook the details and downplay it like it doesn't matter, you need to stick to that question of, no, but how does that actually happen? How do we actually change from frogs to alligators? How in the DNA does the genes change over in such a dramatic way? What does that look like to go from a water-breathing animal to a um, land-breathing animal? And um, keep focusing on that point of it because that is the, the part that they have not figured out. Number four. Learn the difference between testing a theory against the evidence or using selected bits of evidence to support the theory. And I want to be clear as we go into this one, I think that this has been used on both sides of the argument, both creationists and evolutionists. So let's be um, full of integrity and hold ourselves accountable in this area as well. I've long been fascinated by the conflicting messages Darwinists provide concerning the fossil evidence. On the one hand, they proudly point to a small number of fossil finds that supposedly confirm the theory. These include the venerable bird reptile Archeo Archeopteryx. I don't know. Archaeopteryx. 
the whale with feet called Ambulocetus. Ambulocetus. The theris. <laughs> I can't say any of these words. The therisipids. Therapsids. That supposedly link reptiles to mammals, and especially the hominids or ape men like the famous Lucy. These examples all from vertebrate animals, are pressed very insistently on me in debate as proof of the fact of evolution and even the Darwinian mechanism. Okay, so they're saying this is how the mechanism works. I am not as impressed by such examples as Darwinists think I should be because I know that the fossil record overall is extremely disappointing to Darwinian expectations. One prime example is the Cambrian explosion where the basic animal groups all appear suddenly and without evidence of evolutionary ancestors. What is even more interesting is that the evidence for Darwinian macroevolutionary transformations is most conspicuously absent, just where the fossil evidence is most plentiful among marine invertebrates. So we've got lots and lots of fossils from marine invertebrates, but no proof of macroevolution. These animals are plentiful as fossils because they are so frequently covered in sediment upon death, whereas land animals are exposed to scavengers and to the elements. If the theory were true, and if the correct explanation for the difficulty in finding ancestors were the incompleteness of the fossil record, then the evidence for macroevolutionary transitions would be most plentiful where the record is most complete. So in the ocean, when an animal dies, they fall to the bottom and they're covered by sediment and dust and seaweed and such, and their skeletons set there and decompose as they are untouched. On land, you have other things moving it around, wind and animals coming and eat, and so there's a missing fossil pieces all the time. But even in this deep sea area where the fossils are setting there, they cannot find the correct fossils to show any type of macroevolution throughout all of the Earth's history. Here is how Niles Eldridge, highlight that name pink, one of the world's leading experts on invertebrate fossils describes the actual situation. Okay, so this is his explanation for this lack of fossils. No wonder paleontologists shied away from evolution for so long, it never seems to happen. Assiduous collecting up cliff faces yields zigzags, minor oscillations, and the very occasional slight accumulation of change over millions of years at a rate too slow to account for all the prodigious change that has occurred in evolutionary history. When we do see the introduction of evolutionary novelty, it usually shows up with a bang and often with no firm evidence that the fossils did not evolve elsewhere. Evolution cannot forever be going on somewhere else, yet that's how the fossil record has struck many a forlorn paleontologist looking to learn something about evolution. Okay, Eldridge also explains the pressures that could easily lead a forlorn paleontologist to construe a doubtful fossil as an ancestor or evolutionary transitional. Um, people are asking them to find this all the time, so they feel a lot of pressure. Scientists take for granted that the ancestors existed and the transitions occurred, so scientists ought to be finding positive evidence if they expect to have successful careers. According to Eldridge, the pressure for results, positive results, is enormous. This pressure is particularly great in the area of human evolution, where success in establishing a fossil as a human ancestor can turn an obscure paleontologist into a celebrity. Human evolution is also an area where the evidence is most subject to subjective interpretation, because ape and human bones are relatively similar. If you find an ape or human bone that is a bit unusual, you can construe it as a piece of pre-human ancestor. If you can, and if the other experts will support you, your future may be a glorious one. Um, you notice that number one there? If you flip down to the bottom of the page, there's this end note. The ever-changing story of human evolution took a strange new turn late in 1996 when Geochronologists announced a study from Java indicating that three human species, Homo erectus, Neanderthals, and modern humans, those are the three species, apparently coexisted on the earth as recently as 30,000 years ago. The New York Times, 
in December 13, 1996, Front Page Story reported, until a couple of decades ago, scientists conceived of the human lineage as a neat progression of one species to the next and generally thought it impossible that two species could have overlapped in place or time. It also observed, it is not known how much contact the three species had or if they could interbreed. If they could interbreed, then it would be more accurate to say that they were all a single species, Homo sapiens. Such huge areas of uncertainty support my view that general conclusions about evolution should not be drawn from the human fossil record, where the evidence is scanty and the temptation to subjectivity in interpretation is particularly great. Today's fact is likely to be tomorrow's discarded theory. Remember when we were studying in astronomy, how quickly people would believe an astronomer and then he would be proved wrong by the next great astronomer. So know that what is presented as fact today is very likely going to be overturned in the future. We just haven't gotten there yet. Okay, so this kind of explains a little bit about how much pressure there is for archeologists to find fossil structures and they really cannot. If they could, they would be presenting them because it would make, they would solve all the questions and they would become the, literally the most famous person in the world. Back up to our reading. In light of these pressures and temptations, how confident should we be that fossils of human ancestors are really what they purport to be? Could the wish be farther to the thought as it so often is? To forestall outraged protest, I should emphasize that there is nothing cynical about asking these questions, nor do they imply that anybody is committing a deliberate fraud. Remember the wise words of Richard Finman, the first principle is that you must not fool yourself and you are the easiest person to fool. And let me just pause right there. From a psychological point of view, what would we decide what we believe? Our brain is looking for facts to follow that up. If you do any type of business or self-development type of psychological research, you find this all over the place. Believe and your brain will find the facts to support that. So when it comes to science, our brains are working against us. They're not telling us to be critical and to question things. Our brains are actually telling ourselves, hey, you thought this was true? I just found something that proves it, okay? So that's why we have to be so hard on ourselves and why we're so easy to fool. Our brains were created that way. Think how easy it would be for the ambitious fossil hunters to fool themselves when the reward for doing so may be a cover story in National Geographic and a lifetime of research funding. Think how much pressure the other physical anthropologists are under to develop standards that will allow some fossils to be authenticated as human ancestors. A fossil field without fossils is a candidate for extinction. Keeping all of that in mind, why do you think such a high proportion of the fossils used to prove evolution come from this one specialty? Why do you think Niles Eldridge, a specialist in marine invertebrates, uses hominid examples rather than the vast record of fossil invertebrates to argue the case for evolution? If anybody tries to tell you that questions like these are improper, as they probably will, your baloney detector should blow a fuse. A scientist who objects to scientific testing is like a banker who doesn't want the books to be audited by independent accountants. View such people with suspicion. So that is section four. Um, trying to summarize it here. Remember that our brains want to find facts to prove what we already believe. That is just the way the brain functions. So when it comes to science, we all have to be really, really careful to look at the facts and then figure out what does that fact support. Okay, number five. This is our last fallacy for evolution. Learn the difference between intelligent and unintelligent causes. And this might be the most important of all of them. This is a distinction that many otherwise capable scientists do not understand because their materialist philosophy teaches them to disregard it. I'll illustrate the point with a couple of examples. Tim Barra, I like that name pink, is a professor of zoology at Ohio State University. He wrote a book that was published by the Stanford University Press with the title, 
Evolution and the Myth of Creationism, a basic guide to the facts in the evolution debate. Barra's book has much the same purpose as this book. It aims to explain, for non-scientists, how good thinkers should view the conflict between evolution and creation. Here is Barra's explanation of evolution, which comes illustrated with photographs of automobiles in the middle of the book. This is a quote. Everything evolves in the sense of descent with modification, whether it be government policy, religion, sports cars, or organisms. The revolutionary fiberglass Corvette evolved from more mundane automotive ancestors in 1953. Other high points in the Corvette's evolutionary refinement included the 1962 model, in which the original 102 inch was shortened to 98 inches, and the new closed coupe Stingray model was introduced. In 1968 model, the forerunner of today's Corvette morphology, which emerged with removable roof panels, and with the 1978 silver anniversary model with fast back styling. Today's version continues the stepwise refinement that have been accumulating since 1953. The point is that the Corvette evolved through a selection process acting on variations that resulted in a series of transitional forms and an endpoint rather distinct from the starting point. A similar process shapes the evolution of organisms. Of course, every one of those Corvettes was designed by engineers. This is the intelligent designer. The Corvette sequence, like the sequence of Beethoven symphonies, or the opinions of the United States Supreme Court does not illustrate naturalistic evolution at all. It illustrates how intelligent designers will typically achieve their purposes by adding variations to a basic design plan. Above all, such sequences have no tendency whatever to support the claim that there is no need for a creator, since blind natural forces can do the creating. On the contrary, they show that what biologists present as proof of evolution or common ancestry is just as likely to be evidence of common design. I described the credentials of Professor Barra and named the publisher so nobody could accuse me of attacking a straw man. A distinguished university press would not publish such a book without obtaining a professional review certifying that its scientific explanations were reliable. Evidently, the reviewer saw nothing wrong with equating automobile engineering and biological evolution. I am not surprised because evolutionary biologists typically do not understand that sequences resulting from variations on common design principles, as in the Corvette series, point to the existence of common design, not its absence. I have encountered this mistake so often in public debates that I have given it a nickname, Barra's Blunder. This is mistaking intelligent design for natural selection. Remove the engineers and tell me how that Corvette improved itself naturally. A somewhat more sophisticated version of Barra's blunder is to confuse artificial, that is intelligent, selection with natural selection. Francis Crick, highlight that name pink, who is a celebrated molecular biologist and a fervent scientific materialist argued the case for Darwinism in these words. This is the quote. If you doubt the power of natural selection, I urge you to save your soul to read Richard Dawkins book, The Blind Watchmaker. I think you will find it a revelation. Dawkins gives a nice argument to show how far the process of evolution can go in the time available to it. He points out that man by selection has produced an enormous variety of types of dogs such as Pekingese, Bulldogs, and so on, in the space of only a few thousand years. Here, man is the important factor in the environment, and it is his peculiar tastes that have produced, by selective breeding, not by design, the freaks of nature we see perversed all around us as domestic dogs. Yet the time required to do this on an evolutionary scale of hundreds of millions of years is extraordinarily short. So we should not be surprised as the ever greater variety of creatures that natural selection has produced on this much larger time scale, end quote. Was Crick aware that domestic animal breeding requires a pre-existing purposeful intelligence? How can everyone be skipping that? Show me an example where nature has done it on its own. He seems to have sensed it on one level and then wished the ugly fact away by a verbal antithesis. Selective breeding, not design. Did those dogs selective breed by themselves? 
Can they do that without a dog breeder forcing their hand? Once again, we see the truth of Feynman's warning. The easiest person to fool is yourself. Only a powerful unconscious need to overlook the truth could have allowed Crick to conceal from himself that animal breeders are intelligent agents, not blind natural forces. Breeders use expert skills to select just the variants they want, and they carefully protect their over-specialized breeds from the natural selection that would otherwise prevent such freaks from surviving to reproduce their own kind. Selective breeding is not the same thing as natural selection, or even analogous to it. It is intelligent design. Okay, that wraps up the first section going over the fallacies of evolution. Five fallacies of evolution, and each of those I mean, could be a whole book on their own as you can dive into that. We're now going to enter the next part, which is critical thinking for creation. Critical thinking is good for religion too. Every scientific materialist who reads this will understandably want to ask, are you willing to apply baloney detecting to religion as well as to science? The answer is emphatically yes. I can't think of a better way to introduce students to Christianity than to invite them to read the Gospels with care and to ask all the tough questions. I am also not particularly worried about how they answer those questions the first time through. Dealing with the tough questions is a lifelong business, and the most important educational point is not to try to spoon feed students with oversimplified answers that won't stand the tests of time and experience. Here are two examples of the kinds of issues I'd like young people to begin to think about. He tags this as fallacy number six. I think of it as fallacy number one of creation. The problem of suffering. And if you think about this, every time someone has a problem with Christianity, it's not with the specifics or believing the faith that crazy miracles and things have happened. It's always how can a good God allow bad things to happen, okay? This is the fact that people suffer and it is hard to rectify in our minds. So let's hear what we have to say about it. One of the seeming advantages of Darwinism is that it makes it unnecessary to ask why God permits the innocent to suffer and sometimes the wicked to prosper. I highlight that, that statement in green because it really is a question. In a materialistic universe, moral arbitrariness is only to be expected. As Richard Dawkins puts it, nature is not interested one way or the other in suffering unless it affects the survival of DNA. So it's easy to explain why suffering exists. Some religious people actually like Darwinism because they think it gets God off the hook. If, for some reason, the divine plan involved creating by means of scientific laws, then God couldn't intervene to prevent suffering without spoiling his grand scheme. I don't find that convincing, but it's clear that some Darwinists believe in their theory less because of the scientific evidence than because they have theological or philosophical objections to supernatural creation. Of all the heirs of scientific materialism, the silliest is that resolution of the National Academy of Sciences that religion and science are separate realms that should never be considered in the same context. On the contrary, evolutionary scientists are obsessed with the God question, and the problem of suffering is one important aspect of that question. I would tell students that none of the usual answers to the problem of suffering is entirely satisfactory. I want my students to have some familiarity with the classic treatments of the problem, especially by the book of Job and the Grand Inquisitor section of Fyodor Dostoevsky's Dostoevsky. The Brothers Karamazov. Karamazov. Sorry about my pronunciation. As well as a good Christian apologetic like C.S. Lewis's The Problem of Pain. I'd want them to read the Psalms and the Gospels with the problem fully in mind and think about whether and how the suffering and resurrection of Jesus help with it. I'd want them to understand that some of the appeal of Darwinism stems from classic philosophical objections to the doctrine that the world is governed by a creator who loves us and cares about what we do, but would allow us to suffer. Above all, I'd want them to face the fact that if science has its unsolved problems, so does religion. We all see through the glass darkly, but what glass should we be trying to see through? 
So we don't have an answer for this here. This is a mystery, just like many of the fallacies on the side of evolution, okay? That's why there's no scientific proof for the answer to this question. Number seven, which I'm calling number two for Christianity or creation's fallacies. The problem of faith. One of the illusions of scientific materialism is its insistence that materialists don't have faith commitment. Faith is not something people have and others don't. Faith also isn't something opposed to reason. Faith is something that everybody needs to get started in any direction and to keep going in the face of discouragement. Reason builds on a foundation of faith. So I want to clarify, he's meaning you have to have faith to believe in creation because we didn't observe it and can't prove it. But at the same time, you have to have faith to believe in evolution because we didn't observe it, we still haven't observed it, and we can't recreate it. For example, scientific materialists have faith that they will eventually find a materialistic theory to explain the origin of life, even though the experimental evidence may be pretty discouraging for now. So they're holding on to faith that eventually they're going to discover the answers. Because they have faith in their theory, Darwinists believe that common ancestors for the animal phyla once lived on the earth, even though those ancestors can't be found. Niles Eldridge calls himself a knee-jerk neo-Darwinist in spite of the invertebrate fossil record because he is convinced on philosophical grounds that the theory must be true. That's every bit as much of a faith commitment as the belief of a young earth creationist that all radiometric dating must be wrong because it contradicts the literal words of Genesis. And because it is a lot easier to deal with the problem of suffering if pain and death first entered the world after human beings had sinned. Given that every position has its difficulties, where should we put our faith? That, I think, is the question we should all be asking ourselves. To use the words that Jesus taught us, what is the foundation of solid rock and what is the foundation of sand? The Christian says that the rock is God and we should trust in the goodness of God and all the more when the presence of evil and suffering inclines us to doubt. The materialist says the rock is matter and that we should never move from an unshakable faith in science and materialism even when we begin to be discouraged by the difficulties of explaining all the things that do exist without allowing a role to a creator. I think you should draw a square around this last paragraph. I think that is the root of this argument. And I think that if you are having a conversation or a debate with someone, if you all can agree that this is the foundation, that we all have to believe in our theories based upon faith, and then let's look at this honestly. Where do you wanna put your faith? If we can ask ourselves that question, then we don't have to have hatred and, and anger and bitterness between us. We can have a conversation and a debate for the sake of learning and growing and becoming smarter on both sides of the argument. This final section, beginning a new century and a new millennium, is a wrap up of what we've just discussed. Whatever their faith commitments, good thinkers ought to be dissatisfied about the way things stand at the present time. The evidence that can survive baloney detecting isn't likely to satisfy either materialists or creationists. It seems for now as if new forms appeared mysteriously and by no known mechanisms at various widely separated times in the Earth's history. Maybe we'll be stuck with a mystery like that indefinitely, but I think it more likely that the 21st century will see a scientific revolution that will completely change our understanding of the history of life. If I'm right about that, the chance to participate in discovering that new understanding should be a thrilling prospect for young people looking forward to a career in science. What makes science sound boring is the impression that the books give all the important things that have already been discovered and all there is left to do is fill in the details. Showing young people that there is a lot we don't know and that we may even be dead wrong about some of the things we think we do know is the way to fire their imaginations. I don't know what new theories the future may bring, but I think I know where the revolution will start. It will start with the realization that life is not the product of mindless natural forces. Life was designed. Now, I agree with Dr. Johnson, I'm a creationist. Life was designed. And we're gonna get into some of the science in these future chapters of this book. However, I think that if you back up that whether you believe in evolution or you believe in creation, 
that we can all agree to have good conversations and good discussions and debates about this that will further both of our understandings. And I think no matter which side you believe in, that is the heart of education. And that is what we should be aiming for. Good questions, good conversations, good debates. I'm gonna flip back to chapter one at the end where we talked about the different things. First, we talked about this not being a debate between religion and science. Second and third, we covered in this chapter, um, chapter four, talking about the blind watchmakers thesis and talking about the philosophical bias, which is faith-based. Both of these theories are faith-based. Chapter five, the very end of the chapter, is going to dive into this last question. Does such a God really exist, one who is alive and active in our lives today, or is he a fantasy like Santa Claus? That is what we're going to talk about in chapter five. What does all this talk about intelligent design mean? Is there proof of an intelligent designer? Is there proof of God? Or is it a fairy tale that people have created because it gives them comfort when bad things happen? Okay, enjoy your studies. I hope you have great conversations with your directors and your parents this week. Bye-bye.